So today we come to Genesis 26, and we're going to, Lord willing, get through almost the entire chapter. And we have been following the life of Abraham, and now we're focusing on his descendants, starting with Isaac. And as we come to Genesis 26, we will see the life of Isaac and also an encounter that he had with one of his neighbors in the Promised Land. And so the title for today, if you are a note-taker, is Digging Deep into the grace of God, digging deep into the grace of God. You know, one of the characters in the Old Testament who is very significant, but not much is ever really said or written about him, is Isaac. You know, the spotlight always goes to Abraham, to Moses, to David, and there's a lot more text written about those characters, Noah, Joshua, etc., What about Isaac? Do we really know much about him? Well, chapter 26 is the only chapter dedicated entirely to his life and to his journey of faith. And today we'll see that Isaac is a man of faith, a man of great faith. We'll see that he's a peacemaker, that he's not seeking conflict with people when he could easily have defended himself or attacked back or or gotten into conflict. He, He trusts God and he just sidesteps conflict. We'll see that he was faithful to the call, and he trusts God's promise. We'll see that he struggles with some things. He struggles with fear. And also next Sunday, at the end of his life, we'll see that he struggles in how he passes the birthright on to Jacob. But ultimately, Isaac was a man who trusted God and was patient, who worked hard to prepare for his family, for what God had promised for the future. So the chapter starts out with a test of faith. Let's read from verse 1. There was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants... I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your descendants all of these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and commandments, my statutes and my laws, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Isaac faces a test of faith. He, He has a decision to make. Because there's a famine in the land. In Canaan, there's no river. This means, how are we going to eat? And back in Egypt, of course, you know there's the Nile always flowing. And only 100 years previously, there was another famine back in Genesis 12 in the life of Abraham. And Abraham didn't pray. He just quickly left the promised land and went to Egypt. And it turned out to be a big mistake. So the temptation for Isaac is to do the same, to go and take his family and move to Egypt where there would be lots of provision. Here's Isaac, the next generation, and he has to make a decision for himself when facing a temptation, whether he should leave the promised land. Now, verse 2 seems to be the first time God appears to Isaac, and the Lord makes it clear to him, do not go down to Egypt, live in the land which I tell you. See, God is always faithful to direct us into his will and to warn us clearly when we are tempted to go off. We never follow a temptation and say, Lord, you never warned me. He always does. We have his word. And the number one call of God on Isaac's life was simply to stay, to dwell in the promised land. By staying there, Isaac would prepare his family for the promises of God to build a nation through them. You remember two chapters ago when a bride was selected for Isaac, even then he wasn't allowed to leave the land. God made it clear through his dad, stay here. And and they sent a servant, and he had to trust that the servant would bring back a real good woman for him. (laughs) And he did. But he was called to stay in the promised land. That was the act of obedience in, in Isaac's life. That was the act of faith, was simply to stay in the promised land. And now he's faced with a very practical and tempting decision. But verse 3, God promises to take care of him. 
dwell in the land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. Isaac also knew that Abraham faced a similar famine. And when he went to Egypt, it was a bad decision. But Isaac still has to choose for himself between what seems logical to man, oh, the Nile River, or what God has said. And in verse 6, you might want to underline the words, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. That means he chose to obey God. By submitting to God's will, Isaac is becoming a man of faith, a man who God can truly bless. What was the key to Isaac's choice? Well, like all of us, obeying God is hard sometimes, and when it is hard, it requires a heart that will trust God, a heart that is open to God, a heart that will listen and desire to please God more than do what feels right to our logic and our flesh. Even though it's going to be hard, Isaac obediently stays, and he knows he will probably not see all the promises that God has given his family, come to pass anytime soon in his life, but he still decides to stay and to trust God and do the right thing. How about us? How can we endure seasons of trials, seasons of temptations? How can we stay faithful to God even when it requires patience and goes against our human logic to obey God? The way we do it is we hold on to his promises. In verse 4, we see God reaffirmed his promises to Isaac. All the covenant blessings God made to Abraham will come to Isaac and his descendants. It even says, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That's speaking of the Messiah. The promised seed is not just Isaac. It's that God is going to use Isaac to prepare a way for Jesus to come and save all of us. He has to make a decision of faith to stay in the land. You guys, we need to take the long view. Obedience to God is always worth it. And in verse 5, Abraham, it says, God said to him, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. So God is calling Isaac to obey as well, to follow Abraham's example, to heed God's voice, to keep God's charge and keep God's command. Is there a particular temptation In your life these days, an opportunity to rely on human logic and the ideas of the flesh, when you know it compromises your close walk with God or your full obedience to Him, life is full of temptations. The world, the flesh, and the devil conspire to pull us away from God every single day. Oh, you can make more money if you cheat a little. You can have more pleasure if you sin a little. You can avoid challenges if you just... No one will know. God will forgive you the temptations to live a mediocre life are all in front of us. And like Isaac, we can choose to either walk in the faith of our father Abraham by remembering the reality of God's promises and obeying his voice and keeping his charge, or we can just go with our human instincts. Isaac made the right choice. Now, verse 6, it says he stayed in a town called Gerar. Now, Gerar is in the Promised Land. It's near modern-day the Gaza Strip on the southwest of Israel. And like all the Promised Land, there were other tribes living there. They were neighbors. Specifically, the early ancestors of the Philistines lived there. And as soon as Isaac passes one test, staying in the land, now he faces another temptation to fear the men of Gerar. Look at verse 7. And the men of the place asked about his wife. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Ever heard this story before? And he said, no, no, don't say it. Don't say it, Isaac. She's my sister. For he was afraid to say she's my wife because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebekah because she is beautiful to behold. Now, Isaac was growing in his faith but he was not perfect. He passed one test, but then he struggled with the next one. He feared the men of Gerar. Where did Isaac go wrong? It was in verse 7. It says he was afraid to say she's my wife because he thought. His problem wasn't that he was afraid. Fear will come. It was how he handled his fears. 
He listened to his fears and he trusted his own ideas. I'm sure Isaac knew we must always tell the truth and trust God with the outcome. That's basic biblical morals. But he overthinks his way to avoid danger. And in the moment of pressure, he doesn't trust God. He tells a full-on lie. And I find this is so applicable because when we are motivated by fear and we do not slow down and pray and seek God on the issue that, that, that's striking fear into us, when we don't factor God into the equation, then we will make plans and we will make strategies in our lives based on the flesh. And when we make decisions in the flesh, God will not bless them. Now, we also know that Isaac is clearly repeating the sin of his father Abraham, that Abraham did actually twice this whole thing. First, in chapter 12, when, Egypt, when Abraham went to Egypt, and then again in chapter 20, when Abraham lied to Abimelech of the Philistines. Both times, Abraham lied, and he tried the old, she's my sister trick, and it never was necessary. God will protect his people. We can live with honesty, and we can trust God. But Isaac does the same sin as his dad years before, fearing the local men will kill him and take her. Interesting that the morals of the day, even the Philistine pagan tribes, they believed that adultery was wrong. So therefore, let's just murder him, and then we can take her. <laughs> so murder was okay, but adultery was actually wrong in that culture. In verse 8, we'll read about Abimelech. And his title, Abimelech, his name, is, that's, that's not his actual first name. It's like king or pharaoh, Abimelech. So I think this is a different Abimelech than Abraham encountered back in chapter 20, many years before. Now look at verse 8. It came to pass when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac, showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. They knew adultery was wrong. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife will surely be put to death. So quite a while after they've been living there, the king happens to see Isaac and Rebekah together. Now, I don't know, I don't actually read the original King James Version of the Bible very often uh, because of, I, you know, the flowery language, the these and the thous is like 400 years out of date with modern English. But I do admire some of the polite and discreet language of the Old English. If anyone has that version, you know what it says. Behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah. <laughs> so obviously they were playing catch together, you know, <laughs> or softball or something. Sounds like Isaac has definitely got past first base here. And it's kind of creepy because, <laughs> and funny because it says the king is looking in through a window. That's just a bit weird. This king was a bit of a creep. But it says he saw Isaac doing something more <clears throat> than you would do with your sister. So the king calls Isaac and says, dude, you've been lying to me. And he tells Isaac off. And Isaac confesses it. Yeah, okay, you're right. She's my wife. I thought if I told the truth, someone would kill me and take her. And so being caught red-handed, <clears throat> at least Isaac humbles himself now and confesses his sin. Now, the question some people ask about Isaac is, did he have to do this sin because his dad did? And what, what's the connection to Abraham making this same sin twice and, and now Isaac doing it? You know the old saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And this is a specific sin, you know? She's my sister, and it's like father, like son. So how's, how's that connection from one generation sin to another? Well, you know, I'm just going to be simple in my answer, but the Bible would tell us that this is partly connected to Abraham. You see, we can pick up bad behavior and bad patterns 
from our parents. Bad ways of handling stress, bad ways of handling fear from, from people who we see, not even just our parents, but others who we look up to. And as parents, we're always influencing our kids, so we must be careful and know that we are being an example. The way we handle things is going to be the way our kids learn. They're watching us, and they'll learn from us. How important we need to walk in the Spirit, even when things get heated at home, even when there's arguments and fights and disagreements. But don't take this concept too far. Influence is real. Example is real. But don't take it so far to say that there are generational curses regarding sin. Some people tell us that if one person sins, then their children are are almost like fated to sin. They're doomed. And God will put a curse on them, and, and they must be delivered from some demonic possession around a particular sin because it's passed down. And we're just victims of the previous generation. You know what? God does not curse the next generation with entrapment in sin. The Bible doesn't teach generational curses. That's a misunderstanding of Scripture. The Bible teaches consequences. The Bible teaches influence. We're influenced by broken situations, and we do imitate the things we learn, especially what we learn when we're young. Yet sin is overcome in our lives, and even the patterns of sin are overcome in our lives by trusting Jesus and learning to rely on the Holy Spirit and to obey his word. See, Jesus died on the cross to save us, and he rose again to give us a new life. And when we put our personal trust in Jesus Christ, he gives us a new heart. He makes us a new creation. All those old things pass away, and we become new. And he calls us to take personal responsibility for our lives and become disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes we have to fight urges and patterns and struggles. But by God's grace, anyone can change, no matter how ingrained a behavior or a tendency to sin is in our lives. Trust Jesus. Receive him as your Savior today. When he died on the cross, he broke not only the penalty of sin, but even the power of sin over you. Put your faith in him and in the cross. And then you are free to choose to walk with the Lord and to break any mold of sin that has been put into your life by those who have affected you. And if anyone here has a personal struggle with a long-standing sin, you know what, Megan and I are here. And we'd love to have coffee with you. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to uh, talk to you about the journey of becoming a disciple of Jesus and trusting God through those sins. Now, what is most amazing about this story is that God is still gracious to Isaac despite his sin. Somehow, none of the men of the city take Rebekah for themselves. It could have happened because he left her vulnerable by his lie. And here's another part of God's grace. God moves the king into Isaac's life. I think it's God who helped him look through the window and see. And then it's God who then uses the king to correct him. And then even to protect Isaac and Rebekah. Do you see that in verse 11? (laughs) Like, if I was the king, I might kill him. But he says, let everyone not touch them. I think that's God's grace. God is so much more patient and gracious in our lives, even when we struggle with sin, than we think. When we sin, confess it like Isaac did and know that God does forgive, God does show mercy, God does protect us in ways we don't even know. We don't need to fear. We don't need to act in sin. You've got Psalm 94, actually, I think it is, that I wanted you to bookmark. Psalm 94. Yeah, it's Psalm 94, verse 16. This is an amazing This describes Isaac's struggle to understand God's grace when he's struggling with sin. And it describes us too. Verse 16 of Psalm 94 says, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand for me against the workers of iniquity? When you're fearing, it's like, how am I going to get out of this fear? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. If I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your 
comforts delight my soul. Are you facing a temptation, a fear, a struggle with sin? The Lord is with you. And in the multitude of your anxieties, his comforts are there to delight your soul. Spend time with Jesus. And when your foot is about to slip, the Lord in his mercy will hold you up. Are you struggling? Come to the Lord in his mercy. He will hold you up like he shows such mercy to Isaac. Back to Genesis. Now, it is a sad thing when a man or a woman of faith lacks integrity and has to be rebuked by a non-believer, but God will allow even that. And Isaac is reminded that although God forgives sin, God always disciplines those he loves. There's always consequences to sin. And so being rebuked publicly, Isaac now has to humble himself and learn the lesson. And I believe he does. I believe he stops fearing man here and he starts fearing God more because he realizes God, God's preservation plan, God's protection is better than his own self-preservation plan. And he realizes God is merciful and God loves him. Now, I'm convinced he truly repents because he never commits this sin again. Now, repentance means to do a U-turn. It's like you're going the wrong way and you realize it and you confess it and then you actually turn around and say, Lord, I'm going to change. What is the fruit of repentance? It's a clear change of behavior. And so repentance is different than remorse. Remorse is to feel bad that we did it, but repentance is to set ourselves out to change our conduct. And we see Abraham does this sin repeatedly two times. Isaac did it once, and then he confesses it here, and he never does it again. The Bible tells us godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. So when you have that remorse, that's not enough. Go from the godly sorrow to full-on repentance and make a change. And you know, the grace of God is what helps us to change. When we get to know Jesus personally, and he helps us to appreciate, oh, Lord, you love me so much. Look what you did for me on the cross. Wow. When we realize how much Jesus has done for us, we will still struggle. We'll still mess up. But we genuinely don't want to sin anymore. We want to thank the Lord for his forgiveness by living a new life. This is the life of grace. And when someone has remorse over getting caught in a sin, but then they don't repent, I would say they don't really know Jesus. If there's no change, do you really know him? Do you really know how much he's done for you? Isaac repents and doesn't continue anymore. Now, one more point here that I think we'll really develop more on Thursday night is just look, zooming out, look at the big picture. Two tests, the famine and then the fear. He passes the famine test, but then he struggles with the fear one. And I think we need to talk about being spiritually alert because you may be fighting one battle and, and winning, but you know how it is. The enemy can come and send a temptation from behind all of a sudden, and we can suddenly fall. And what, what does it mean to live in a, a way that is spiritually alert? Jesus talked about it when he said, watch and pray lest you enter temptation. And it, we'll talk about Ephesians chapter 6, putting on the whole armor of God. And how do we do that? How do we walk spiritually alert and prepared for different strategies and wiles of the devil that will come from so many different directions? And just when we're out of one battle, there's another one starting. Come on Thursday night and we'll have a talk, talk about seeing victory with more consistency in our lives as we take up the whole armor of God and have a soft heart to God's warnings and leadings and say, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh today. Help me walk in greater victory. So on to verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. That's a good year. In fact, that's a great year, a hundredfold. <laughs> that's a lot. It's like, I don't know, tell me if my math's correct on the spot here. If you invested $50 this season, and then at the end of the season, you got $5,000 back. It's a hundredfold increase. Would you, give, would, you, would you invest 50 bucks right now, knowing you'll get 5000 back? 
So Isaac is doing pretty well here because God is being gracious to him. This is unmerited favor. He just sinned. Why is God blessing him a hundredfold? Because grace is unmerited favor. God isn't looking for us to have a perfect performance. He's looking for us to have a heart for him. Even as Isaac turned from his sin, quickly God blessed him way beyond what he deserved. That's the grace of God. Now it also says in verse 12, Isaac sowed in the land. That means he trusted God by staying in the land and sowing. That means he worked hard. He was a son of a very rich man and he could have slacked off and lived on the family inheritance, but he knew that work is a blessing and God created mankind to work, so he worked. And he worked hard, he sowed, he sowed, he sowed, and he realized that God is going to bless him so he can prepare for the next generation. And God blessed him in an outstanding way. Look at verse 13. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Man, God is so gracious, he starts to have this great abundance that he doesn't deserve. You know, Romans 5 verse 20 It says, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And when we confess our sin, prepare for God's grace. Walk in humility. We talked about that last week. June is the month of extra humility, extra stay humble month for us as believers. Lord, that's where he can bless us, is staying humble and not going with pride, not going with our own, parading ourselves, but we are here to say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow your word. And that's where the real blessing is, is in humility and staying humble before God. And where, you know, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, the Bible says, over and over again. And so here we see the company of Isaac is growing. Isaac Incorporated is booming. (laughs) He's blessed. Truly, he's repented of his sin. He's obeying God in the land, and God is blessing him. Imagine how much he would have missed out if he had left God's call and gone to Egypt. Wouldn't have been good. He'd have missed out on all this blessing. The world tempts us and says, here's the plan, just do it yourself. But God says, honor me and I will honor you. God wants to bless us. God wants to take care of us much more than we know if we will stay humble and we will follow his word. And now Isaac is blessed so much that he can now be a blessing to others. He can be a blessing to his wife. He can be a blessing to his descendants. He can even be a blessing to his neighbors because he's living by faith. Verse 14, it ends by saying, so the Philistines envied him. You know, when we're obeying God and God is blessing our life, expect opposition. The Philistines saw Isaac prospering and they were jealous And they know he's a sinner. I mean, he recently lied to them. And now he's being supernaturally blessed a hundredfold. How is this possible? You see, the world can never wrap its mind around God's grace. God's blessing in our lives is is so beyond human logic. It's so much better than what we deserve. And so they despise him. They even attack him. Look at verse 15. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells, which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, And they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and he dwelt there. So that's not far. He's gone from the town of Gerar to the valley of Gerar. He's moving a little bit away from the conflict. Now, they stopped up the wells, it says. You see, in the desert, the water is life. And a well is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And how do you dig a well in those days? I mean, I guess you have two guys. One's got a shovel. He starts digging a hole. And eventually when he gets down, the other guy lowers a bucket and he keeps pulling the dirt up. And you've got to keep digging, digging, digging until you get down to the water table. Was it 30 feet, 50 feet? We don't know. There's a lot of work. I imagine it would be a lot easier to fill a well than to dig a well. And along come the Philistines and they vandalize all the wells of Abraham, his father. They fill them up. Because they have envy for Isaac and God's blessing in his life. You know, when we make a decision to seek Jesus, we should not be surprised when the world hates us and seeks to hurt us. 
when you make a choice to live by faith, we should expect some level of rejection from man and spiritual opposition. Jesus said in John 15, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Rejection and hatred from the world, ah, it hurts and it stings. I remember the first time working in a dental lab, trying to be a light to all these other guys working on the bench, making gold crowns and stuff. And I remember trying to share the gospel with people, but trying to be a good worker, work hard and, and be a good example. I remember one time this guy just blew up at me and for no reason. And then another Christian guy, older guy, leaned over and said, you know he hates you. <laughs> and it stung. I was like, why would anyone hate me? I try so hard to be nice. But I'm shining for Jesus and the world hates it. And it hurts. Don't be surprised. If you try to live a good life for God, you'll face opposition. You try to start a good devotional life in the mornings, you'll be opposed. You're trying to be honest in your business, there'll be a challenge. You're trying to have a godly marriage, Satan will come against you. Every time we obey God, every time we take a step of faith, opposition will come. Do not be surprised if there's opposition. Actually, be surprised if there's no opposition, <laughs> right? If there's no challenge, maybe you're not doing it right. Now, how did Isaac handle the opposition? By digging deeper and continuing to walk by faith. Look at verse 18. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. Here's the key to faith. Isaac kept going. He didn't quit. He didn't back away. He didn't freak out. He kept going. He just works hard and keeps digging. And he goes back to those old wells and he's like, well, let's dig them up again. That's a lot of work, but he's going to do it. They've been filled up, but he's going to redig them. And then he names them after the same names of his, that his father named them. A hundred years ago, Abraham had left his comfortable life of faith in Ur of the Chaldees. And he moved here and he built these wells because it was a sign of God's provision and his faith. And so now Isaac is going back to the faith by digging these wells, the faith of his father, the faith of the old generation before him. I love the symbolism here because Isaac is now practicing this faith for himself, the faith that he has inherited. You know, we don't need some kind of new religion, some kind of new progressive Christianity that departs from Scripture and the truth. We need to go back to the old wells. We need to go back to the provision God has made, the well of his word, the well of his spirit. And we must not live for our own image, for our own flash and our flesh, for cultural coolness, for worldly logic and worldly methods. Don't try and create provision outside of what God has already provided. We can draw deeply from Jesus. And that's been given to us by many generations before us who've set the pattern for us. But we need to make a personal choice to go back to the wells of God's provision and dig for ourselves. Parents and grandparents, you are setting an example for the next generation. And we can teach our kids, we can train them, we can show them that God is real by how he's working in our life. We can testify of God's work and provision to us. And one day our kids will have to choose for themselves and by God's grace, they will dig again the wells that we have drank from. They will dig into God's grace. You know, the most wonderful thing in my entire life is if my kids one day on their own faith start drinking from the grace of God like me and Megan have done in our life and saying, Lord, forgive me, save me, fill me, help me rely on you and rely on your word. And all we can do is is dig the wells up for them and show them and, and feed them, and one day they're going to be without us, and they've got to make that decision. So Isaac digs again the wells of his father Abraham and names them by those names. It's a good picture for us to stay in the truth and to really believe it and live it. 
Verse 19, also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and they found a well of running water there. I underlined that. They dug in the valley and then they find like a spring. This is the best kind. Like this, they don't even have to lower a bucket. It's just coming up. You know, the valley is a place of testing and of trial in our life. The valleys are times of refining. You know, Psalm 23 talks about going through the valleys of the shadow of death. I don't like going through valleys. Are you in a valley, my friend? Dig deep. Don't give up. You'll find the spring of living water. Are you discouraged? Are you feeling spiritual opposition in your life? Is the battle real? Dig deep and you will find running water. You will find the grace of God afresh to sustain you. Dig in the valleys, guys. Verse 20, but the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, hey, this water is ours. And he called the name of the well Isaac because they quarreled with him. Okay, there's a battle going on over this well. So what does he do? Verse 21, then they dug another well. (laughs) And they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they didn't quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth. Because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. I like that. I underlined it. The Lord has made room for us. He testifies that God has provided, that God is looking after him, that God is blessing him, and he praises the Lord. Do we give God the glory he deserves in our life? Now notice there's a bit of a a journey to get to a place of space. The first well, Isaac is called contention. The next well is called opposition, and he doesn't fight there. He just moves on, keeps digging, and then he finds one and calls it roominess or spaciousness, Rehoboth, like this is our place now. We've got space to dwell. And I think that's cool because Isaac just keeps moving and keeps providing for his family by faith. He doesn't get sucked into battles that he doesn't need to fight because God's going to provide for him. He has the promises of God. God's going to look after him. He doesn't need to defend himself. But by faith, he can just say, whatever, have the well, I'm going to dig another one. I like that. We've got to know which mountains to die on. Sometimes we're not called to fight into battles with this world. We're called to just trust God and keep faithful to him, keep moving, and not get distracted, not get provoked but trust the Lord and lead a quiet and peaceable life and shine brightly. And as Isaac does that, he now has a deeper experience. Look at verse 23, a deeper experience in the Lord. It says, he went up from there to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. Underline that. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And he pitched his tent there. And Isaac's servants dug another well. That's the fifth well I've, re- I've noticed so far. Hey, they just keep digging, right? Just keep digging. Sometimes life is just about trusting God, keep moving. And as the Lord appears and reveals himself to us, we can keep receiving his provision as we keep digging into the Lord. So God used these conflicts to actually bring Isaac closer to himself. Do you see that? When Isaac responded by just staying faithful, the Lord met him. And Isaac had to to really struggle with these, these battles. I mean, they were filling up his dad's wells, then they were taking his wells. I'm sure it was a battle, but he stayed faithful, and God provided. And then God meets him, and God says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do you know God's with you? And the presence of the Lord is what dispels our fear. Do you know God is with you? It's the presence of the Lord. And when we're fearing something, when we're living in fear, we've forgotten that the Lord is with us, that the Lord is so much greater. Psalm 118 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We've got to remember some of these great verses. Another psalm says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Is that real? Is that real to you? Psalm 27 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
And God here tells him, I am with you. Do you know that's what Jesus said to the disciples uh, when he was ascended up to heaven and they were like, no, you can't leave, we need you. And he said, I'm always with you. I'll never forsake you, I'll never leave you. In fact, he even taught them, I'm gonna send my Holy Spirit who will even dwell inside of you. God is living, making residence in you. He's always with you. Let's keep going. Verse 26. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with two guys with funny names, uh, Huzath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said, Oh, we've certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, Let us now... Let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good. Not exactly true there, buddy. And we have sent you away in peace. No, you didn't. He ran away from you. Uh, You are now blessed of the Lord. It's amazing here how the enemy actually does recognize God's work in Isaac. And the enemy now has a different attitude toward him. You know, when we're humble and when we obey God with our standards, with our lifestyle, with our morals, with a humble attitude, and we don't get sucked into fighting with people, the Lord can really shine through us. Isaac didn't fight fire with fire. He fought it with water. He believed God, that God was going to take care of him. He stayed in the land, and he didn't make war with the Philistines. I'm sure he could have beaten them up. (laughs) but he never did. He just kept moving and digging. And he worked hard to provide for his family. And he did so in a way that was clearly obeying God and trusting God. And now even the Philistines can see God's blessing on him. You know, Proverbs 16 is an interesting principle. Verse 7 says, when a man's ways please the Lord, God makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's not always true, but it's a good principle. And that is, as we're growing in our faith and in our character, there will be some people, even in the world, who see the Lord in us and respect us because we're growing more like Jesus. They won't necessarily understand it. So a good question that we should ask ourselves is, are we growing, becoming more like Jesus in the way we treat people, in the way we handle ourselves in business, in the marketplace, in the way we are in our neighborhood? Are we reflecting the Lord, and and are we worthy of respect by our actions? Or are we trying to fight for every scrap and defend ourselves? Verse 30, so he made them a feast. Interesting, his enemies a few verses ago. Verse 30 says he makes them a feast. And they ate and they drank. Then they arose early in the morning, and they swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Now this feast sets a seal. It marks a covenant between Isaac and his neighbors. He had been enemies with them. He had never fought them. He just kept moving and digging. And now they have a feast and it marks a peace treaty. Proverbs twenty five twenty one says, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. That means... They're just going to be blown away by the grace of God. You know, people who know the grace of God are gracious. People who've been restored by God look to restore relationships, look to make a difference. My pastor used to say, rescued people, rescue people. I like that. If you've been rescued by the grace of God, you're looking to show grace and to bring others to the cross to shine bright for Jesus as you go to work this week, to shine bright for the Lord in your neighborhood as you talk with your neighbors to be gracious and caring and looking for ways to bless them. We'll close with verse 32 and 33. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug that day. And they said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sheba because the name of the city is Sheba unto this day. There we go. That, that, that ends the chapter for today. We'll pick up verse 34 
next Sunday because it's getting into Esau and he's really part of the next chapter. But I like that those two verses there. It says the very same day as Isaac is now being kind to his enemies, it says that the Lord blessed him with another well. And Sheba means oath. So he, he makes a marker to say, we've made an oath, we've made a promise to be peaceful with each other. And he calls it Sheba. And there's a town there, it says, even in Moses' day, as he wrote Genesis, called Beersheba. And you know that that town is still there today. Beersheba. Right in the heart of the promised land. So the wells are a picture of God's constant provision of grace in Isaac's life. Isaac knew deep down God will always provide. Keep trusting God, keep digging, keep digging deep. And that he was blessed even though he messed up beyond what he deserved because of the grace of God and because he repented of his sin. Here's the conclusion from today's sermon. Are you digging deep into Jesus? Are you going through a trial? Are you going through a battle? The call is to dig deep. And if I can share a personal story about this as we close. When we went through the first lockdown back last March and last April, and every day the news was changing, every day things were getting taken away from us, every day uh, we didn't know what was, was going to happen. And we'd only just become a church at the time uh, independently and as a charity and trusting God to provide. And I just thought, well, this was good for two months and this is not going to last. And there were so many temptations to just kind of start strategizing in the flesh and just try and maybe, maybe we should just give up. Maybe we should just go back to Calgary. Like, I don't know. Like, all these thoughts were flying in. Not that I took those ones seriously, but, but I'll tell you the real struggle of that, that first lockdown was just weariness, just being overwhelmed and exhausted. I don't know if you went through a season of like low energy and low uh, spunk. <laughs> I sure did. And you know what the word of the Lord was to me in that time? It was, Colin, keep digging. Digging deep into my grace. Keep digging into the Lord. Keep relying on God. Keep going. And I have to say, in my weakness and my overwhelmness, I had nothing left. I did not have a word I did not have energy to study. I could look at my Bible on the computer and I just had nothing there to even study. And I'm sure you've been through times, maybe you're going through a time where you're just so low in a valley. And the Bible teaches us, keep going, God is with you. Do not fear. And, and keep digging deep into the Lord's grace. And sometimes he calls us to work hard and to dig deeper, to press in, even when we've got nothing. In fact, that's exactly the point. We got nothing. And that's a good thing. I learned in that time that God is so sufficient, that God is, his grace is more than sufficient for me. That if I keep doing what he's called me to do, keep showing up, keep reading his word, keep praying, God's going to answer in his time. God's going to provide. And God always gave me what I needed, just in time. Keep digging deep into your faith. Keep digging deep into Jesus. Keep praying. Keep reading his word. Keep going to church. When you don't feel like it, that's when you need to do it. That's when you need to be in the word and in church. When the battle heats up, our prayer, our thought is, Lord, just take the battle away. And the Lord's word is, no, I want you to go deeper into me in this time. I want you to trust me. Digging is never fun. Even that picture of digging the well and the guy going down the hole and putting, that, that just tires me out just thinking of that picture. <laughs> but you know what? Times of prayer, times of waiting on the Lord, times of patience, times of desperately seeking God, it's hard work. But you know what? We, we're called to rely on the Holy Spirit and say, I got nothing, Lord. Would you be my strength? And he tells us that his grace is sufficient. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See, Jesus is the well. Jesus is the one who we'll find when we dig deep into God's word and into God's truth. We'll, we'll know Jesus more. We'll know him. 
We'll know him in the power of his resurrection and we'll know him in the fellowship of sufferings. We'll press on and say, Lord, it's not about me, it's about you. And it's about the next generation after me. It's about me making good decisions today that will bless others who watch my example, who see my life. And God will be with you. God will strengthen you. He will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Don't give up. Dig deeper like Isaac did into the grace of God. Let's bow our heads today. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that it's not about our performance and our goodness. It's not about our ability to overcome. It's not about try harder and self, self-power, self-provision, self-help. It's about desperately calling out to you and not giving up. Lord, it's about trusting in you. And Lord, you know what everyone here is going through, the trials, the temptations in our lives. Thank you that you're always with us, that you never leave us, and that you desire to get us through every season and to shine bright through us. And we pray less of us, Lord, and more of you. And may people see our lives in our homes, in our business, in our neighborhood. Let them see the grace of God at work because we are digging deep beyond ourselves into the grace of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for all you do for us, that you never leave us, that you give us unmerited favor if we'll simply turn from sin and trust you and obey. Mm -hmm. And so we do that today. In Jesus' name, amen.